the part of the DCPP, we have A, B, and C components. Component C is entitled predictability mechanisms and case studies. We haven't heard too much about predictability, except Arun has just told us there's no use in looking at predictability. And so I'm going to try and ask the question in a rather different way and saying, when might you be potentially possibly able to learn something about predictability from um, Minor Road, everybody? When might you be able to learn something about predictability um, from models? And so I will try, rather than, uh, I will try to, to dazzle you with uh, various equations and so forth, and we'll see how far we get. Um, basically, um, in one of these meetings, in one of these Aspen meetings, I gave a talk, I think it was a 2008 one, in fact, and it was entitled, What are the Prospects for Decadal Prediction? And I uh, gave these as the conclusions. And I said, there's excellent prospects that will be made, modest prospects that will be skillful, and improving prospects for their use. Well, I mean, these were exactly outstandingly uh, difficult predictions, but of course, they came true. And this is perhaps uh, coming true to some extent. And then I asked, what are our data what are the data, what are the motivations for doing decadal predictions? And all of this used to be nice colors, but you can't really see them now. But the thing, a couple of the reasons for doing this were the results of predictability studies and demonstrations of forecast skill. So how do these things fit together? So what I will try and do is run through uh, some uh, uh, calculations and uh, considerations about predictability. And predictability, we mean the, the kind of perfect model predictability aspect and forecast skill. So it's based on our uh, models, uh, decadal hindcast results, every year, third date, start dates, 10 members, uh, Karen bias correction method. And uh, we also have 10 member ensemble of climate simulations that and we consider annual mean temperature as the basic variable. And the basic idea then is to use the hindcast to investigate both predictability and forecast skill. So of course, the agreement of the forecast with the observations gives us the actual skill. And the agreement of the forecasts amongst themselves is a measure of predictability, and which we term potential skill if we express it in the same way as we do with the actual skill. And of course, this is potential in the sense that if the model is close enough to the real world, this might give you some useful idea of whether you could uh, conceivably uh, strive to improve your model. And then these simulations, you can perhaps separate to some extent the force and the internally generated component. So what we do then is try to consider actual and potential skill measures or these very standard measures of forecast skill, namely the correlation, the mean square error, and the mean square skill score. Oop. Well, <clears throat> so this is where I try to, to dazzle you with equations. Um, we represent our observations as capital X, forecast as capital Y. Uh, they have a mean component. They have a predictable component. So when we're talking about the signal to noise, this is the signal component. And these are the, this is the noise component. Uh, the ensemble mean has a subscript A. And the idea is the ensemble mean retains the predictable component, but starts to average out the noise component. And if you had a big enough ensemble, you could isolate the signal component. So we, uh, look, at the, we look at the second order variances and covariances. Here is the variance of the signal component, here's the variance of the noise component, and here's the covariance of the observations or the uh, of the system, we can call it, with the model's ensemble mean. And it's just the, just the covariance of the signal components of the observations and of the model. And so the covariance is the, the standard deviations times this correlation between the signal components. And if we do this for the model, considering the model to predict itself, um, we get the same sort of relationship. And this is just the variance of the signal. 
Instead of signal to noise ratio, we consider the potentially predictable variance fraction of the observations. So this is the fraction of the total variation of variance of the observations. That is the signal. And this is the same thing for the model. And this represents the, the, the ratio of the variance. So there's various other relationships that arise. But now we can at least write down equations for the relationship between the actual uh, correlation and the potential correlation. So here is what the actual correlation is for an ensemble mean forecast. And here is the relationship. So the actual and potential correlation skill is related by this expression, which is the square root of these potential predictability variance fractions times this correlation of, of, the, of the, um, the signal components. So if we, if we knew what these things were, we would have an idea of whether or not the potential uh, correlation had any relationship to the actual correlation. And then we, we could perhaps deduce whether or not we could improve our model. Here's the same thing for the mean square error. Just make it simple. I, I uh, did this for the large ensemble uh, uh, limit. But the point is that the relationship now is more complicated. It involves not only, the, the, if you, not only these potential predictability variance fractions, uh, this, this term here, but it involves also the potential predictability variance fraction of the model and the standard deviation, the ratio of the variances of the, of the um, uh, model and observations. And again, mean, mean square skill score also has, also has um, a relationship that we can write down. Well, this is all very well. Um, and just as a matter of interest and very quickly, uh, there might be other uses for writing down these relationships. Uh, they may have some implications for scaling the forecasts. And you may be able to use them to interpret differences between different models or changes in initialization or what have you. So if we take the correlation here, it's expressed in terms of these quantities. And let's say we changed our model. And we have two different models. And we're asking, what is the reason that the, the, the uh, correlation changed? And so this represents the difference between the models. This is the representation of the potential predictability. And it's something that we can infer from our sequence of forecasts. And this is the, the model's um, variance fraction. So we can infer this also. And then we can learn uh, which of these terms has changed in order to change the, the, the correlation difference in these two models. So you can do things like that with these kinds of relationships. In um, practice, if we try and apply these uh, ideas to real, a real experiment, like the experiment I've, that we've performed with our model, we can look and see what we get in terms of potential correlation and actual correlation. Uh, this is for annual, um, annual average temperature. And so this is for year one, we do quite well. Year three, somewhat less well year five, somewhat less well. And of course, the potential correlation is typically greater than the actual correlation. And this is just what we expect. And we might try and convince ourselves that you know, we can do better and make this approach this if we had a better model or improving things in some way. Arun would tell us that this is not ever true. And I would say this is not always true. Um, <laughs> If we try and estimate the difference between the force component and the internally generated component, then, of course, things look worse because the force component has quite a bit of skill and the internally generated component uh, rather less. So here is the potential correlation of the internally generated component. And it falls off rather rapidly. Interestingly, we see sort of a standard result for these kinds of potential uh, measures. In other words, there's some skill, some potential predictability in the North Atlantic and in the Southern Ocean. 
and not a lot over the land. And these are the kind of results that you can get from other kinds of studies of model, of model predictability, for instance. And then for the actual correlation, we do even worse. And then this is this diagram that um, I showed earlier. And the, you know, the idea now, is there some utility in thinking that we might be able to improve the actual skill to at least get closer to the potential skill? And someone uh, by the name of A. Kumar, for instance, said, you know, ask this question, is there a connection between potential and actual skill? And he's pretty negative about that. Um, and, you know, yes, OK. <laughs> I'd have to make it sound a little more exciting than that. So here are the decadal predictability questions. So is a potential skill a useful indication of attainable skill as you know, we implied in, in this uh, paper. And then someone, some people question this in the context of seasonal forecasting. Others have actually indicated, found cases where this is not the skill, uh, not the case. So, you know, do we just, is that it? Or is there any, is there any hope? Uh, and we might also ask, you know, why is there no connection? You know, we, there is, you know, predictability measures started out for weather prediction, you know, gave us a predictability limit, all that stuff seemed to work. So why is it, you know, so much worse for climate? Or we could turn it around and ask, if there is a connection, what is it? And so, you know, there are these explicit algebraic relationships uh, for these common skill measures. They depend on second order climate statistics. And so perhaps we can investigate the conditions under which these are suitable measures over or under estimates of attainable skill by looking at this, at these algebraic relationships. So there, for correlation, for instance, they depend on uh, this alpha, uh, this r, and this gamma. And p is the system's predictability variance fraction. So that's, a, this is directly related to, well, not linearly, but directly related to our own signal to noise uh, ratio. So the two are, in a sense, synonymous. Unfortunately, and this is one of the difficulties with knowing uh, how many ensemble members you need or whatever is because you don't know P. You don't know the signal to noise ratio typically unless you have other information or are willing to make some assumptions. So this makes it very hard to infer when we can use potential skill measures uh, and, and learn whether there are actually any, any um, use for what we might attain uh, in, this, in these measures. Well, we can know certainly when they fail. Uh, they certainly fail to indicate, the potential skill measures fail to indicate attainable or realizable skill. Uh, obviously, when the actual measures are better, give a better result than the potential measures. And in these cases, this is uh, for some of the cases I mentioned earlier, actually demonstrated this in certain cases then it's obvious the actual skill exceeds the potential skill, if this is the case. And the potential skill measures underestimate the attainable skill. So that's pretty straightforward. And so we certainly, there's some virtue in perhaps comparing these. For correlation, uh, for correlation if this happens to be the case, if R is you know, actual is greater than potential, we can show that the potential uh, variance fraction or the signal, to, effectively the signal to noise ratio is greater um, for the system than it is for, for the model. And that, of course, makes sense. But what's the more usual case, uh, at least I, is that actual skill is worse than the potential skill. And if this is the case, then uh, we can uh, show that P is less than this expression. We know that this has got to be less than one but it doesn't tell us you know, what to make of the relationship between the system uh, variability fraction and the, and the models. We might be able to suggest that this rho is a suitable measure of potentially obtainable correlation, provided we may reasonably assume that this is the case. If we demand absolutely to know this, we just give up. But if we may assume it in some, under some reasonable assumptions, uh, this, this may be okay. 
And there are additional conditions that apply for mean square error and mean square skill score, because they involve also gamma and Q. Oops, now what? Um, oops, OK. So one of the ways we might think about this and is that if we write this again in, in this fashion, in the case of perfect model, if your model was improved enough so that this correlation became one, this would be the ultimate in, in the correlation between the um, predictable components. And this is just what the, what the perfect model has. In that case, we could t say that when rho was a good estimate of r would be if p is equal to q, and it would be an overestimate, and p would be less if, if p is less than q, and so forth. Uh, in, we have a similar relationships for um, uh, mean square skill score and so forth. So all of this is just the algebra. And here is supposed to give you um, an indication of how that might play out. So here's the ratio of the, the P and Q. Here's the gamma, the ratio of the variances. Here's the spot you'd like to be, where both of these are one. But uh, in this area, on the left side of this dashed line, rho is an overestimate of the achievable correlation. On this side, it's an underestimate. And on the left and right side of this curved line, um, the potential M mean square skill score is an underestimate, and here's it's an overestimate. So you can see that for some uh, cases in the middle here, you can have one of these scores as an underestimate and the other as an overestimate. So, you know, just one score never works. Two minutes, Thank you. Um, this shows you this in three dimensions. So what does this mean? If any of, of these are are you know, bigger than you, than you expect, or less than you expect in the case of mean square skill score, potential measures clearly underestimate the actual skill. If gamma is not equal one, it doesn't affect correlation, but does affect mean square error and mean square skill score. And if you looked at this, along this line, you, know, you, you can get um, that, that these are suitable measures even if p isn't equal to q, but not, not for all of the three measures simultaneously. And, so, and there's also a question about whether you can tell the difference uh, if you look at real data. But I won't go into that now. This is what, in, in the case in our model, what we looked at was um, annual average temperature. And we actually have uh, three measures of, in this case, the standard deviation of annual average temperature. We use the GIS data to verify our model. Um, and this is the standard deviation for GIS, for ECMWF, and for the forecast. So we ask to ourselves, you know, how close is gamma to equal to 1? How close is our model's um, variance to the, to the observations? So this is the case when it's related to GIS, related to ECMWF. And this is what happens if you look at the ratio ECMWF to GIS. And so we do see that our model tends to be more variable, has more variance in many areas, but not all, than the, quote, observations, but that the observations don't entirely agree with themselves, at least in this simple-minded view. If we look at the correlation difference, and so anything that's, that's colored has positive colors, this suggests uh, that, that you know, the actual correlation is greater than the potential correlation. So we know that over these areas, something uh, that, the, that the potential correlation is underestimating the available correlation, at least according to this verification data. And this is l largely over land, which is, in fact, where we, where we um, have not been able to see a lot of potential predictability in, in pure predictability studies. And this is the ratio of the potential mean square error to actual mean square error. And you can see that there's lots of yellow areas, areas here. And these are, of course, because our model is more variable than the observations we used to verify it with. And so this is misleadingly uh, telling us that um, 
that you know we're not we're not doing uh, well. Uh, this is just to show you that if you scale things, things get better. So what does it all mean? Um, so this is what I what uh, I was leading up to, uh, and it's it's not too different from what Arun Arun said. If gamma is if the ratio of these variances are approximately equal to one, and these are all uh, the size we, we expect, then I would argue that it's not unreasonable to assume that the signal to noise or the potentially predictable variance fractions are roughly the same because the model is not uh, demonstrably different than the real world, and that you may then use potential skill measures as an estimate of attainable skill. Of course, if this is not the case, uh, then your, your potential skill clearly underestimates actual skill. If gamma is not equal to one or approximately equal to one, um, you, you um, have to make some judicious um, assumptions un unless um, you can show that you know, it doesn't really, really apply. Observation-based statistics may be uncertain, um, as we've seen, and statistical estimation aspects are non-trivial. But I claim that nevertheless, the relationships between actual and potential skill measures provide another way of looking at the model of system behavior, and it's worth doing some of these predictability runs. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thanks, George. A quick question. In one of your first slides, you sort of like you said bias correction and you in parentheses said Karim method. Are we now as DCPP favoring that particular method? Uh, if that is the case, then should the component A and B indicate that? We there's a certain amount of discussion about that, and I don't think we're favoring any method at the moment. Um, we're favoring that everyone explain what method they use. Uh, because I don't know if the, if the so is jury any, is out on this. Is there any advantage or disadvantage of using this particular method over others? Well, the, the argument is the one that John tried to ask earlier, which is that if your model over predicts, say, there's forced response, and if you just remove an average bias, then there will be the, the correction will, will, will differ early in the record and late in the record. And it doesn't apply to correlations. What doesn't apply to correlations? Does it apply to correlations too? Well, I, I, I think that if you, yes, if you misforecast the correlations and misforecast the force component or the trend, you will get a different answer than if you correctly forecast it. You may get a better answer if you over forecast it, in fact, I claim under certain circumstances. So you have to be very careful about, about the, the skill scores and this correction thing, yes. I mean, you know, another way to look at the constraint of the how the model compares with observation. I mean, initial expectation is to check the order correlation of the quantity you're trying to predict in the observation versus an initialized prediction. So if the order correlation, let's say, the model is, is higher, that means the forecast is diverging much faster than it actually happened in observation. That it does tell you something about the signal to noise. Yes, yes. Yes, well, it tells, you, it tells you about the model signal to noise. It tells you Q, but it doesn't really tell you P, yeah? You can at least compare to some very basic order, the order correlation between, let's say, Whatever quantity you're trying to predict in the 50 years of observation you might have versus what's that? Well, I don't see the I don't see the connection between the autocorrelation. Well, there is a connection between the autocorrelation and the p, uh, the the you know the actual autocorrelation is a function of the p, this potential predictive variance fraction, times the autocorrelation of the signal. But I don't know what that tells you because you don't know what the autocorrelation. Of the signal is exactly. So, George, you mentioned that we don't know the system predictability. Yes, I did. Um, but do you not think that the actual skill that we get with with, uh, with our particular 
um, forecast systems gives us some indication of the system predictability, probably a lower, le lower limit. Well, there is this relationship that I rushed by. Um, it, you see, you, you need to know, let's see, if, we t if we're dealing with correlation, Correlation, the relationship between the actual and the potential correlation involves this ratio of P and Q plus this correlation of the predictable components. So all you can deduce is this product, the square root of P times the ratio, or times the correlation of the predictable components. You can't separate the two as far as I'm aware.